So we'd like to welcome you to another uh, presentation of the Revelation series. This will be um, volume three or session three with Stephen Hargrave. Um, and it's, it's really about the, about the apostles. And I wanted to make a couple of comments going into this. Um, it's really a general critique of the errors that we're finding in the videos. It should be noted that in viewing or reviewing these premier teachings, um, that these documents are really the center of COGR beliefs, and there is no proof in them that there are gentle apostles, Gentile apostles who will rule during the end times. Uh, no proof that the book of Revelation is about the COGR. Uh, no proof that Ray Tinsman is an angel or that the seventh trumpet ministry is even a thing. All of their teachings are based on speculation and not truth. The Bible has become a prop to support a fanciful narrative if a person read scripture apart from their speculative teaching, no one would ever come to the conclusions that they present as being the truth. So with that, we're going to go ahead and begin to look at a presentation uh, that Steve gave. And um, during this presentation, uh, it is really um, exaltation of apostles. Uh, it's It's little more than the uh, idea that there is something special about the 12 that are located uh, in Greensville, Ohio, or in their churches. And Steve will in one place say that, oh no, we're talking about the original apostles, but then he immediately changes tune and admits that he is referring to all of them, uh, all of the uh, Gentile apostles. Verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained, listen, before the world unto our glory. All right. I'll leave that with you. I'll just leave that with you. The apostles saying that God ordained this wisdom before the foundation of the world, and it was for their glory. All the saints, yes, but first the apostles, right. to the glory of of the apostles. I should read it again in case someone uh, babbles along and talks about how this is incorrect. We'll read it again. Verse 7. This is going to get better, although to me this is already good. But it's unfair to you because I already know what I'm going to say. Verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. I have to stop. Paul's preaching, the apostles' preaching, was preaching inside of a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world, unto our glory. Now that's either talking about the apostles or the saints or the saints and the apostles. And if it's talking about the saints and the apostles, it's talking about the apostles first because apostles are first. Mm -hmm. Is that all right? Yes, sir. All right. So what do we think about that? Overall, uh, and it's maybe a commentary on the entire message. One thing that I thought was interesting hearing it, ostensibly it's about um, the, well, replacement theology sort of, um, and the the um, fullness of the Gentiles and salvation of Israel and things like that. But it it is always interesting to hear them because from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And everything that I hear coming out of there lately is about apostolic authority it's about shoring up their own personal very it's a very small group of people that we're talking about um their hold over people and their their control over uh, the keys of the kingdom and i think that's that's the thrust of that clip taking a scripture adding in um the apostles in there and taking a taking a thing like well a Apostles first, a phrase from a different scripture, and just applying it, sort of claiming, um, claiming uh, preeminence for apostles 
it would work on any doctrine on any blessing mm -hmm. and i i agree with you ben uh in my experience the, the short time i was there any opportunity they can take to elevate themselves such as using the scripture of the apostles first they really take that opportunity to exert their authority and just make sure everybody knows that the apostles are first. Uh, it's it has a quite a strong hold over the the congregation, unfortunately. It's interesting to me that he takes a point, um, and that is when you read the word "us," for instance, who does it apply to? And he then kind of plays with it. And he says, well, it could be it could be all the saints or it could be the apostles, but, you know, it's going to be the apostles first. And by the time he gets done kneading it and shaping it, you get the opinion that it is the apostles who are the ones who have the spirit. It is the apostles who have the word of God. It is the apostles who are are really on top of this. And um, that's somewhat deceptive. If you take the passage itself and you read um, the, the commentaries about it, it turns out that most of the commentators, um, by a vast majority, I might add, um, understand that the audience was the entire Christian church, uh, Corinthian church. Uh, and the uh, the language, there's nothing that makes it exclusive uh, to only be the apostles. Um, he, Paul gives no sense that there's an apostolic ranking um, and um, nowhere does he say that the wisdom and the glory is limited to the apostles. Um, so the argument is a, it's a tad deceptive. Um, it really is the, it's the believers uh, who share in this glory. Um, and of course, in this slide we're looking at, he rejects that and says, oh, well, in case anybody's babbling along about something different, well, that is just kind of an intimidation uh, tactic to keep people from responding to it. Um, doesn't work that way. So it's primarily all believers. The apostles are first. That's interesting. Um, what does it mean that the apostles are first? So he's taking that from the scripture, right, that says... Um... He set the members in place, first apostles. Yeah, first apostles and prophets, then yeah. teachers. And... Yeah. Commentary-wise, there are two ways that it's viewed. One is that there is indeed a hierarchy, and the apostles are first in preeminence. Um, the other is that it's functional, because when Paul went out or when the apostles went out, they went into an area and they taught and they expanded the church and then the prophets and the teachers came in and then built upon the foundation that had been established so there can be a functional understanding of that and that makes more sense to me um, commentaries do see it both ways but what you don't ever see in the scripture at any point is the apostle standing up and saying i am first and you will toe the line it is always a cooperative, a uh, almost a love relationship between the apostles and the churches that they are serving. You never see the kind of arrogance uh, or narcissism uh, that you see exhibited when Stephen gets up and says, you know, we are first. That is foreign to scripture, and it should be a huge red flag. Yeah. There's little doubt historically uh, that, that the apostles was an authoritative position. Do you all agree with that? I mean, if you look at... Absolutely. And, and, and they were leaders in the church. They absolutely. decided doctrines. You know, Paul definitely sometimes uh, leans on his on some sort of authority that he claims to get directly from Jesus Christ um, to have some kind of an authoritative position. But I do think that there are a lot of scriptures uh, that bear on what you're saying, Lee, like... Um, not to take the best seat at a feast, not to lord it over God's heritage. Um, and Paul, I think, was a good example of that. And that's quite distasteful in their preaching lately, is that there really is a kind of a hierarchy uh, with people that are on top. And the, the, the people on top deserve certain amounts of respect. Not just that, not just here, but they have, in fact, uh, frankly, a different kind of salvation, perhaps. You know, 
there's an interesting interweaving here, even in this phrase, apostles are first, because again, ostensibly the thrust of the sermon uh, rotates around um, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, which is the same turn of phrase, to the Jew first. And part of the teaching here and from the Bible, he talks about the way that the first shall be last in the parable. Um, and there's, that's not the way they use first when they talk about apostles. They don't, I don't find them going and saying, well, then the first will be last. And these are the most humble positions. And these are the servants. In fact, they're the ones that are going to sit on thrones that do sit on thrones that have a preeminence uh, innately um, and in the heavenlies as well as here on earth. And then, and not just in the heavenlies, it's not just, well, I'm sort of a spiritual father and I, you know, they actually, I think, want to want to have and expect to have um, a tangible kingdom uh, and and actually govern, you know, pieces of land on the planet and have real authority over people's lives. Oh, yeah, Ab absolutely. Um, all of that is a little bit ironic because if you hear the words of Jesus, Jesus talked about the fact that, that you know, it, to be great, I mean, you have to be the servant of all. Right. And you don't see much servanting taking place there. What you see is dominion and power and um, coercion of people. It's a it's a huge red flag. Yeah, and, and a frankly uncomfortable pathological acceptance of that position. I've been in that group. I was a leader in that group um, in my locality. Um, I was basically the uh, top dog patriarch. Um, and felt that feeling and the temptation to power, um, and the admiration of the saints and stuff. And, I uh, found myself, I found just in my personality that I didn't get off on that. If you'll excuse the phrase. Um, and some people do, and it's, it's, uh, this kind of power is attractive to those kinds of people and it's corrupting. Um, and I think that's the influence Absolutely. that I've seen working over the last few years in this group. Yeah. And and I, I see the same thing, Ben. And 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 certainly they do not see themselves as serving the people. It's more like a dictatorship. And when you speak about the, the apostles having authority, the, the real apostles during Jesus' time, they they weren't dictators over their followers. And the church of God, you can't even go on a trip without asking them permission. Mm -hmm. You can't miss a meeting without letting them know why you're going to miss the meeting. Mm -hmm. And if that's a, a, an acceptable reason to them for you to, to not be present. Yeah. One of the great uh, turning points in the history of religion, I mean, was this New Testament idea, which is what Paul's driving at in my reading of it, is the democratization of the Holy Ghost. It's not something that lives in a building, something that lives inside of all of us. It's something that's poured out on the entire congregation that everyone has direct access to. Um, that, you know, there's one mediator, uh, that's maybe even one too many could be argued in the sense that I, I, there shouldn't be a priestly cast and someone who is, uh, interpreting scripture for the individuals. Everyone has the divine spark. Everyone has access to that. I think that that is why Paul's message was so controversial because he's saying there's not a particular bloodline. There's not particular um, special people, uh, but the the amazing thing, the amazing mystery that he is describing that he is so excited about is the fact that that he's not the God of the Jews only, but of the Gentiles as well. And he's not the God of Ray only, but of me as well. And everyone's got the same divinity and, and God's no respecter of persons. This is an interesting section. The apostles are prophets hearing from God. God hath revealed the things that he hath prepared for those that love him unto the apostles. Re God has revealed to the apostles. If you want to hear from God, you got to talk to the apostles. Now, you know, the interesting part of that is that God did indeed reveal to the apostles that mystery because they were the only place that that mystery could have come from uh, and been given to the population at large. Um, but not in the sense that Stephen is talking about. 
there was a mystery, and that mystery was Jesus Christ, who came and died for us on the cross in order that we might have eternal life, that Satan would be defeated and that we would move from, from death to life. That was the mystery. The mystery is already out there. I can find that mystery um, by going to Scripture, and the Holy Spirit will guide me in my efforts to get there. So it's strange to me that we have a that you have an apostle, a leader of a group of people who, in theory, is the um, uh, the wisest of the group, uh, the wisest of that assembly, making statements that are so clearly out of line with Scripture. It's um, it's bizarre to me. They're out of line with scripture, but their followers, um, and we've had this discussion before, Lee, um, many of them, uh, and I, but I'm not sure if you encountered this at all or not, but the congregation in Elmer, most of them come from a, a Mennonite background. So they're low German speaking people. They, they just recently published uh, Bibles in low German language because it was not a written language before. It, it really still isn't now. So that most of them cannot read their low German Bible. They cannot read the English Bible. So all they have is the messages that the COGR are putting out on their Gospel Trumpet app. So they don't really go to Scripture to see what it, what it says. They're relying on what they're hearing from, from Ray Tinsman and, and the other apostles. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't find that kind of illiteracy, but um, that's certainly danger. And even for literate people, there's a really deep programming and you hear it constantly. It's what they're reinforcing with all of this, that um, your own worldly wisdom, um, your own, you know, he calls it bootleg theology. And he has all of these, there's a constant juxtaposition between when my mouth is moving, the truth is coming out. When your brain is working, it's faulty. You don't have the direct line to God. These things are revealed. That's why he adds under the apostles yes. and these things. And he's he's wanting to make sure that he's the porter at, at the door of truth and that you're only getting in uh, with his leave. And uh, that's, again, not what the scripture teaches. The Bereans, they were, they were more noble than the rest because they went and they checked to see if the things that Paul was saying were true. Um, it's one of the most dangerous things that can happen in religion is when people turn their, their own thinking faculties, even their own mystical experiences off and subordinate that to someone else who inevitably is going to want to control them. I've told Ray, even if you're a benevolent leader and will only ever do the saints well, and things are all in order, the next guy or the guy after him is going to walk into this system of defenseless um, victims. And, and this kind of power, as I said, is attractive to those kinds of manipulators. I know Stephen Hargrave had said that the, the apostle's job was to be uh, have the cutting edge understanding. Of course, God will re reveal that to them. And that our responsibility was just to understand it and believe it. And that if we didn't understand what he was saying, it wasn't the apostle's job to help us to understand. He was basically saying, this is what I'm saying. This is the truth that's being revealed to me. If you don't understand it too bad, believe it anyway. All you need to do is pay, pray, and obey. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that is, that is about it. <laughs> um, and if you were to grant that these truly were God's apostles, and if you were to grant that they were hearing from God, what choice would you have but to simply go, oh, yes, sir, and, and accept everything they said at face value? I mean, that's a 50 years ago, I was associated with a group that was very similar to this, and um, it doesn't go anywhere good. You can't. There's an embarrassing, self defeating demonstration of this constantly if you if you participate there for a while anecdotally in my own experience um i got in trouble a couple times for sharing things or 
thinking things, believing things that weren't that brother Danny didn't like. Uh, it wasn't done before. He said one time at a minister's meeting, uh, he said it, a day after I had presented to him a couple of things that I thought were interesting in the scripture that were novel. He said, if God's going to give us new ideas, it's going to come from people up here in the front row. It's not going to come from anybody in the back row. And I remember me and uh, a couple of the brothers I could name looking at each other in the back row, like (laughs) that's our cue to shut up, you know? Yeah. Uh, And the irony is uh, I could give a couple specific examples. One, I got in trouble for handing out the sermon, 10 shekels into shirt by Paris Reed head. Uh, Brother Danny said, all her founts are in her. We don't want any of that outside preaching. A few years later, 10 shekels in a shirt. Somebody else discovers it, somebody with a little more cachet, and it's all the rage, and it's fine. But it was wrong because I did it, and it was okay because they did it. And Steve goes so far nowadays as to uh, you know, put Tupac in the pantheon because it's someone that he enjoys. Yes, I, he has a... I don't think you could get by in the average church <laughs> with some of the things that he has identified as uh, as being okay, but um, I digress. And he's the decider of what's okay. Uh, he says, "Yeah, they can get tattoos. You can't." Yeah, I can not. I can innovate on this outfit and put a African scarf on. I can decide which music to listen to. You can't because you're a child, and I'm your parent, and. Uh, I realized one day I'm an adult and I don't need a mom. Yeah, right. we're, we're actually going to go there in a little bit, but that's an important concept because the idea is that Christians are encouraged in scripture to grow and to mature. And a lot of the behaviors coming from that group prevent that from happening. And rather they're made it dependent. And um, that can't be right. It can't be good. It's a good point. Part of maturing is leaving your parents' home. You know, someone who stays at home, lives with mom and dad, subordinates to mom and dad, isn't a mature person. No. But the spirit, which is of God. That we might know the things that are freely given us. That we might know. We got God's spirit because really God's the only one that knows. Say amen. Amen. So God's spirit, the only one that knows. And so we've received his spirit, the apostles, Say amen. Amen. So that God can help us to tell you what God was thinking about. Say amen. Amen. So we receive that spirit of God, not the spirit of the world, so that we can tell you some things. What things are you going to tell? I found that to be offensive. (laughs) (laughs) That, That gets my blood going. It's completely... It's com- he's com- added the word. He's revealed it to the apostles. First of all, even if you want to take the scriptures, mm-hmm. and he's added that. Um, and just the way, just the way that he is leading the people through these sort of steps. You believe that, right? Everybody's with that. Give me some. Give me some verbals. You know, you're just watching the crowd. Um, be led. Be led astray. Uh, it's. It's a good example. And because the apostles have the spirit, we're to assume that nobody else does, which is really kind of an interesting thing. So they are going to tell us things. And if I were to think about it for a moment, I'd say, you know, the mystery has been revealed. That's what the original apostles did. They they shared that mystery with us. You don't have much to tell me anymore. Not that it's going to be new and novel, at least. Um, and who has God's spirit? Uh, I've got a list of things here. Believers in Christ from Ephesians, those baptized with the Spirit from Acts, born-again Christians from John, children of God from Romans, all believers from Romans. All those people have the Spirit. It is not just the apostles who have the Spirit. And we know that um, from 1 Corinthians, from John, from Romans, and 1 John, that believers are people who God shares his Spirit with explains things to, shows things to. So he makes an exclusive claim that just doesn't hold up. Yeah, I think logically it is akin to to saying that they don't have the spirit because he carefully says, nobody knows the mind of God, but the spirit of God. And his point is, 
we have the spirit of God. Well, he wouldn't deny that other congregants have the spirit of God. The Mormons have to deal with this when they, because they believe in an ongoing revelation and Smith quickly discovered a problem. If everyone was having revelation, they were having revelations that he didn't agree with. Um, and so to this day, a, a priesthood holder can um, still get personal revelation, but it's kind of in it's hierarchical. So they'll get revelation about themselves and those subordinate to them. And say if they're, you know, if they're the leader of a ward or something, they might get revelation for their the people that they control. Um, but they wouldn't get revelation on bigger levels. And and they, you know, presumably are accepting of the revelations that could roll down the hill. Hmm. I don't know that the COGR has thought that um carefully about it, but I would imagine that model probably is something they would adopt. Yeah. It, it seems like that. And and I want to go back to when you mentioned sort of the pathology behind it. Even, even when Stephen's preaching, he's always saying, okay, say amen, say amen. It's almost like once you say amen, you're in agreement with what he's saying, right. whether you really are or not, but you're not even really thinking about it. You're just yeah. sort of being indoctrinated at that point and, the, and then agreeing with it. But yeah, it, many it's a sales their, trick. Yeah, yes. And many of their uh, apostles, if you want to call them that, uh, I've heard a few of them say that you don't have a, re- a personal relationship with the Lord. Right. So when you're doing your personal devotions, you don't have a personal relationship. And when you think that uh, the Lord is working with you or speaking to you when you're reading through scripture, that's not really what's happening there. You just think that's what's happening. Yeah. I mean, he says, why did God tell us these things? So that we could tell you what God yes. has to say. Yeah. And, you know, the, it's fishy when a lot of what God has to say is about me giving you my money. Yes. And, and me obeying <laughs> me obeying your uh, cultural whims, dressing like you tell me to, listening to music you allow. Yep. Indeed. You listen to so much of this, and I try to go in with an open heart. I enjoy preaching and, and getting things, and I don't mind if who the messenger is. And sometimes I do listen to COG and uh, there's good stuff in there occasionally. It's fairly rare lately. Um, But I don't hear that, you know, the preaching is no longer as much as it felt like when I was there, I'm getting good stuff for my life, how to treat my family, how to improve my soul, how to be better, how to be more at peace. So, so much of what is preached is about apostolic primacy. It's gross. Yes, and I, I found the same thing. Uh, I, I know I shared with you, Ben, that I started. To, I joined the COGR about two years ago, and it, it wasn't because of the political preaching at the time, but there certainly was a lot of political preaching in Elmer. And when that sort of died down, well, actually, when the borders opened between Canada and the U.S., the apostles from Greenville were now coming to Elmer, mm. and thing you know the page really turned then and all they were preaching about was revelation and how they found themselves in prophecy mm-hmm. how the lord told them that they are sitting on thrones messianic seats here uh and it really just sort of revolved started to revolve around them as being apostles apostles first that was stressed meeting after meeting after meeting uh, almost made me ill when they would say we're going to turn to Revelation chapter, it's like, oh, not again. Um, it was just the same thing over and over and over and over. Just yeah. drilled into you. And the focus of it has really, the aperture has gotten smaller and smaller. Um, the chart behind them, you know, the it's when I learned it was largely about the church as a whole and the church age and stuff. And increasingly it's about 12 apostles. All the scriptures become about apostles. And that's really about the three. And those are really contained in the one guy. Um, yes. and that's innovative from, from when Brother Danny was there. He never, I felt, put himself in such a place that it was his personal um, being that was important in the way that I get the vibe from Ray and Steve. That it's yes. that persons that, that God is honoring and that are important to the movement. End of the world. 
Mm -hmm. especially Ray Tinsman. They really focus on him. Yeah. Every everything comes through through Ray. Steve is most vocal, but everything seems to to revolve around Ray Tinsman. And and be and once they decided he was that that angel, that rainbow angel in Revelation. They they preach endlessly about about that. It's pretty fascinating to watch. Yes. To watch the group develop. So I'll bring this to a close. Uh, if you have any further questions, feel free to contact either Lee or myself. Our contact information uh, will be at an end slide at the end of the video. Disappointment is a bitter pill to swallow. Paying back the hope I borrowed from someone I never knew. And it's a poor fit. Humans in the suits of heroes Undressed by whispered conspiracies In quest for the truth But if the truth is what you're looking for You don't get to choose the answers so tell me, do you really still believe that the truth will set you free? I do. I do. Someday, well, if the truth.